Welcome to another Geometry Nodes tutorial. In this one, we're going to be creating this fun little... It's like a fake fluid effect. It's largely done in the shader, but it's going to introduce you to some simulation nodes as well. You might recognize this from Half-Life Alex. This effect was all over Twitter as people were trying to work out how to make it. But in Geometry Nodes now in 3.6, we have simulation nodes. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to get the similar kind of fake liquid effect. Some caveats, we're going to be limited by our rendering pipeline, so only NPR for this one, but the thinking process, this is going to get you into some really fun places with geometry nodes. First of all, before we get into Blender, a quick word from our sponsor. So I have released three new courses for simulation nodes. We have got Bouncing Ball, where we're going to be looking at uh, applying forces to an object, collisions, rotations, um, we have got Boids, this is for flocks of birds and schools of fish, things like that, where we have multiple different objects and we want them to flow and engage with each other. Uh, that's going to be touching on uh, the Boid mechanics, but also collision detection. We're going to be doing attractor objects, repeller objects, guide splines. We're going to be doing adversarial Boids as well, so we have predators and prey. And lastly, we've also got erosion, which is hydraulic erosion with soil transport. So this is fantastic for making really big grand landscapes where you want to have those kinds of erosion lines down hills. All of these are hosted over on Node Group, which is my new platform for technical artists. So if you're interested, go and check the link down in the description to find out more. Let's jump into Blender. I am in the most recent stable build of 3.6, and we're going to be predominantly working in shader and geometry nodes today. So let's start off by making, I'm, you know, I'm just going to use a Suzanne. That's going to be perfect for this. You can make a bottle or a cube or a cylinder. It really doesn't matter what you use. The, uh, the process is totally mesh agnostic. Let's jump in with a subdivision surface just to smooth her out. I'm going to go two levels and then I'm going to add some geometry nodes on here. Let's go into rendered view. We're actually going to turn off our world strength turn that to zero and I'm going to make sure I'm in EV here as well. Now let's turn off wireframe, face orientation. Okay, this is probably more like what you're looking at. In geometry nodes, uh, I'm going to name this node tree to be liquid bottle and we're going to be also adding a new shader editor in here which is going to have the same name, so liquid bottle. Let's get rid of this principle BSDF. We're not going to use any conventional shader nodes. And the reason for this is going to become really apparent as we work through the shader. So let's just hold that thought. <laughs> let's get to a point where we can actually build the initial shader. We'll build our liquid, we'll build our water bottle, and then it will, it will make itself clear. In our geometry nodes, let's start off by assigning the material. Set material, liquid bottle. If you are using simulation nodes, which we will be in 3.6, the material assignments are lost during the simulation, which means even though we have uh, the material actually on the object, through the simulation nodes, we might lose it. So let's just set the material first. And then separately, we're going to create a different surface for the liquid inside the bottle as the bottle. So this is going to give us a slight offset. So to do this, we simply want to take our set material through a set position node. Let's make this big. We are going to be setting the offset here via the normal. So we're going in the direction of the surface normal, scaled by some amount. And this is going to just displace that surface. We can then have a look at what this is going to be. Let's go back to solid view. If I view the output here, that was shift alt left click to join to the group output. Now you can see what that's doing. So we want to go slightly inside here, 0 0.03 uh, in the negative. And we also want to make sure that we're defining this as being our liquid. So let's go and just search for a store named attribute on here. We're going to create a mask by setting it Boolean, which is on everywhere and will be called liquid. Now we can simply join this with our set material. Control shift right click and drag. And now we have two hulls, one internally, which is defined as liquid and one externally, which we will use as the bottle. 
Lastly, we're going to define the color, which we will do in geometry nodes, just so that we have it on our modifier. Let's use another store named attribute in here. This is going to be called color and it's going to be a type color. Let's just set this immediately to a nice red color, just so that we have something to look at. And uh, that will almost do it. We'll just use another group input over here to define that color. Okay, now it's on our modifier. All good. We'll just rename that to be our color. Cool, all right. Let's set up our shader. We are going to need to get back into our material preview or rendered view. Let's start off with an attribute input node. We're going to be looking for the color attribute. Let's just make sure this shows up. It does. And let's make sure it's connected. It is. All right. Make that a bit bigger. How are we going to define the liquid? Because let's think about this. We do not have, if I cut this in half, well, let's mask off half of it and then you'll see the problem. So first of all, grab an input texture coordinate node. This is going to give us our object coordinates. Object coordinates are always going to hold to your object position, right? So we're always going to be around this origin. So we're going to use the origin to define the liquid level. If you wanted to do it manually, you could use a vector math node and just subtract on the Z axis. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to work with the origin instead. I always can just move the mesh manually. Take our object coordinates and we're just going to take a dot product from here, 001, and you can see that gives you a gradient in the direction of your second vector. So this is a really useful skill to have. If you have a standard Cartesian coordinate space and you dot product against some vector, you will get a gradient, linear gradient in the direction of that vector. From here, we can simply put this through a less than to find the area beneath zero. And this is going to be our water. So that's us done. Fantastic. That was easy. This is our mask. We are going to be using this now to define where our liquid is. So we'll start off with a shader, mix shader. This less than is the factor. And then above, which is going to be zero, this is going to be a transparent shader. We haven't lost the top here. You can see it's still there. So let's make sure that we also just go into our material settings. Viewport display if you're in cycles, but for EV, you're going to be in settings. So what we can do is set our blend mode here to be alpha clip. This is super lightweight and it's just going to give us a threshold uh, where we want to cut off all of our surface finishes here. They're going to be hard edged masks. So this is going to work perfectly for what we're doing. Now, let's think about the other side of this. Let's just drop a principal shader on here. Principal BSDF. You might notice <laughs> that we're looking down inside the mesh. It's pretty clear that this is not just a flat top. How can we make it appear like a flat top? That's what we're interested in doing. So the answer here is actually going to be controlling the normals. We can basically just say, well, if you're looking at the back of a face, then you should really be looking at the top. There's only one hole and that's going to be at the top. So let's try this. We're going to take the normal from our principal shader. Let's put this back through a mix. And the factor here is going to be coming off the back facing socket of a geometry node. So back facing is going to give you a mask, a zero for the front of a face, a one for the back of a face. So if we have zero for the front, then we can plug the current normal into socket A. And there we go. So the front still looks like the front. I can right click shade smooth. All looks correct. Let's just hide that. Control H to hide unused. What about the inside? Well, if I set this to zero, zero, one, then it certainly made a bit of an improvement, but we have some shadowing. We have some weirdness going on. It's not great. And if I was to start turning this as well, then you're going to end up with some weird shading artifacts going on, especially if you're using this on another object like a cylinder or a cube, you're going to end up with some strangeness where we have those flat 
uh, flat side. So if I copy the modifier on the cube, let me remove that subdivision. So yeah, you can see there's, there's no way you would be tricked into thinking this was a flat top. How do we get around this? Well, unfortunately, this is a limitation of Blender and its shaders. We have clamped the normals. They can't point uh, like through the face. They can't go backwards from where they're pointing, which means that we don't have total control over our shader unless we make the shader ourselves. So that's what we're going to do. That's why we're going for this NPR style, the non photo real. It's a very easy process that we actually have to do here. So let's get started. We have our normals. Let's compare these with a dot product against the incoming ray. And the incoming ray, it's on the geometry node. It is the vector from the camera to the object, right? If I view incoming ray, there you go. You can see that we're basically just looking, oh, sorry, from the surface to the camera, I should say. So there we go. What this means is that if I plug this into our mix shader, well, now that's great. Look at this. We don't have any issues with shading. This looks exactly like a flat topped object. It's kind of like magic. And this is really the basics of Fong shading. So this is how everybody used to do shading forever. You would just do the dot product of the incoming against the normal, and then that would give you something. Or maybe you would use the dot product of the normal against some vector which would be pointing towards your light source. And then that would give you the effect of direct illumination. How a little bit more on that as we come through here. So let's take our dot product. We're going to be passing this through a color ramp so that we can control it a little bit better like this. And then from here, we're going to be passing this into a mix node, a mix RGB. I will set this to multiply. There we go, multiply. And we will be using our attribute color as the color. Nice and Easy, set that factor to one, and we're golden. All right, so this is looking pretty neat. Let's tweak some of these settings. Let's bring our color ramp. We'll bring the middle down. We'll add another flag in the middle. We want to add a bit of darkness to the middle sections. Let's set this to B spline so it's a bit smoother. And I might just pull in that edge a little bit make it paler. You can be as strong or as subtle as you want with this. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do something like this, I think. So it's fairly hard fall off on the left and a nice gentle fall off towards the right. There we go. All right. So now we have something that sort of looks like it has a flat top, which is exactly what we're after here. Let's frame up these nodes, control J. This one is going to be our liquid shader. And now let's quickly work through building our glass shader. We're working still in this kind of NPR style. So let's carry on with that. Another mix shader. We are going to be plugging into the bottom socket of it with our, uh, with our wine here. Let's use another input attribute node. This one is going to be called liquid. And we're going to be using this as our factor. So now if I actually swap that around, you can see that we have the wine on the outside, the black on the inside. So only one shell is now being assigned our liquid. We're wanting to do a couple of things. So let's use another mix shader. And we want to know some information about our wine bottle. We want it to look shiny. So we need to add a reflection. To do this, grab a geometry node. We're going to take the normal dot product against the up vector. So zero, zero, one. And in here, we can use a greater than set to some relatively high value 0.8 should be fine into our mix. There we go. If we look back at our shader, let's make sure that we have an emission shader set for that. So we're just doing it essentially shadeless. I'm going to set the strength of this to three just to make sure it's extra bright. Now for the rest of the glass, we want to actually use another mix shader because we want to mix between transparent and emission again. So this is going to give us um, an emissive edge, like a, a rim light around the glass, as well as 
transparent so we can see through it. Once again, we're going to take our geometry node and we're going to do the dot product of the normal against the incoming. So this is just a standard Fong shader. So for where we're looking from, looking pretty good. And for this, we will use a less than node, which we can now set how wide we want that rim. Maybe around 0.3, something around there. Now you can skip these steps if you want. You can just go for a, a layer weight node, grab like the Fresnel and a less than. And that's going to be the same kind of thing, equally a facing node, same kind of thing. We're just building it manually, so it's it's good to know this stuff. Now our glass shader is going to be a mix between a transparent node and an emission node. There we go. And I'm actually going to set my emission strength back to one and our color. I want this to be a little bit blue. Just looks nice and stylized there. Add back in our shiny. It's looking pretty good. And then when we mix it back with our liquid as well, there we have it. So now we have a little bit of a glass edge on some NPR liquid. I'm going to grab all of these ones. Control J, let's call this one bottle shader. And then we have our liquid shader down at the bottom and we have our mask that we're going to be using later on or creating later on. We're going to take a break. We're going to be jumping into simulation nodes. What is it that we actually need to know to make our objects slosh around? Because right now they're just a bit static. They're not doing anything smart. So we need some information. We need to know how far has it moved from one frame to the next, but we need some damping on that as well. So not just how far have we moved, but also how far have we been moving? This is actually very easy for us to set up and I will walk you through the process step by step here. But essentially, we're interested in the location. And if we think about it, we also want it to slosh when we rotate it. So location and rotation. Let's come back. This setup is going to be a little bit of a mind bender. So apologies if this is your first foray into simulation nodes. Um, this is maybe a non-standard use case. However, the workflow that we're going to be doing, especially for calculating the change of position, for doing that with damping over time, that's common stuff. And how we just think about loops, this is common stuff. So irrespective of where you're coming from, this is going to be a useful lesson. Now, simulation nodes. You have two nodes, you have an input and an output. The way it works is information comes in through the simulation input during the first frame of the simulation, and then it is stored in the simulation output after being operated on. The next frame, it loads from the simulation output and the simulation input sockets are closed. What this means for, for us, why I'm telling you this, is because we want this to update as we move it. For it to update as we move it, it means we cannot come through the simulation input because if we do this, then after the first frame, it's going to stop updating. We obviously want those updates all the time, which means that we need to join into the middle. This is fine. We can do that. It's just going to make our nodes look a bit strange because we don't have any inputs. So let's take our group input through our simulation output and then the simulation output into that set material. What we need to do is find the location of our object. I could find the location of the surface points, but I actually really want the location of the object because I'm going to be moving this around in object mode. So to do this, we can use an input scene object info node, and we will drive the object picker from the self object, meaning the self. If I view the output of this, and I'm going to need some geometry, there we go. If I move this around, you can see that we change color. If I set this to relative, you can see that we go back to black. Relative is going to be the position of our object info object relative to our self. However, we're looking for the self, which means that this is always going to read zero. We're always on the position that we are on. Setting it to original is going to use its world space position, the one that you find when you go into item location. 
Now we don't just need the location, we need the location now, and we need the location in the previous frame, because that way we can work out the difference between now and the previous frame, and that way we can work out how fast we're moving. Let's do this. So thinking about simulation nodes, we're gonna bring in our location, it's gonna go into the simulation output node, and it's gonna load into the simulation input node on the next frame, which means that this location is the one from the previous frame. I'm just gonna get rid of that viewer. We're gonna take our location, subtract our current location, and then we are going to need to sample this onto our geometry. If I just view this directly, it's not really gonna do anything different from just viewing this. Oh, it's gonna invert it actually. So our subtract is back to front. There we go. So you can see it's just the flat color exactly the same as this. So we're not actually bringing this through because this geometry is not connected. If you know about geometry nodes, the geometry is your processing line. If it is not connected, the node is not evaluated. So what does this mean for us? Well, all we need to do, take our geometry through a sample index node, which we're gonna to set to vector, plug this in like this. Now we can plug this in. Now if I play the timeline, as I move this, you can see that we're going to a brighter color as I move, and then it's coming down to zero again. So no damping, it's just changing instantaneously based on the difference in position since the last frame. So we're well on our way now. Uh, we didn't need to set anything for our index because this is all constant. And you can see it's all solid lines, solid noodles, and it's coming off the location, which is a, obviously a constant value. So using just an index of zero is gonna be nice and fast for us here. Instead of just using a viewer node here, let's create a store named attribute. So we're gonna come in, attribute, store named attribute. We're gonna be storing a vector on the point domain. We're gonna call this one flow. So the um, flowing of the liquid within the vessel, we're just gonna call it flow. So sample index into that one. To create the effect of damping, we need to release the flow attribute gradually. It can't just update as we work through here. If I add a named attribute node, looking at flow, and I just view this. There we go, like this. As I move this around, you can see that it just changes instantaneously. So let's work this out. Rather than using the subtract directly, let's actually add the value of the subtract to the current flow value. So let's take a flow here. We're going to add to it this subtracted value. And then we can plug this into our simulation output like so. Press N, we're gonna go into our simulation output. Let's call this one flow as well. So now what we need to do is just make sure that this flow amount is joining into the sample index. So now the sample index is just reading the, uh, this change. So as I move it now, you can see that it's getting brighter and as I move it, we're changing this vector. So it's additive. Now to add damping to this, we are going to use a mix node, mix color, actually a mix vector. I'm gonna be mixing from this value towards zero. Uh, we may come back and change this, but for now let's say zero. The rate of your damping is gonna be defined by the factor. If I play this, you can see it damps very quickly. If I move this around, it's gonna dim quite quickly. If I set this to be very close to the bottom, then you can see it fades much slower. So it's barely walking towards this 0 0.37. Um, and I will also just change my frame range. Go into here. Let's just add a couple of zeros to the end of that. So it's gonna glitch as it restarts the timeline otherwise. So as I play, you can see that we now have this dimming effect. And the reason that we just mixed here, you can of course use a subtract, but you can't use subtract when you're working with vectors in this way, because we need to be able to get down and past zero. Going past zero means something different. So in this case, we need to mix or interpolate towards a desired central value. Let's speed this up a little bit, maybe 0.1, something like that. That's pretty good, I think. Cool, okay, cool. 
this is going nicely. Now we just did location before that we were also going to be doing rotation so that it understands where the rotation is coming through. And just the same, let's take our rotation socket into the simulation output. I'm going to reorder these. So simulation output, let's put flow to the bottom, rotation in the top there. Let's just put some reroutes down here so we can see what's going on. And once again, we're going to take another subtract. We're going to take our rotation into the bottom. We are going to take the rotation of the object into the top, just the same. And we're actually just going to add these two together. So that is going to be fine. If I move it, it's going to do what we expect. As I rotate it, it's going to do what we expect as well. You may need to reverse these or not, but we will find this out as we go back to the shader. All right, so let's actually head back to the shader. Right now, what we've been doing is using the object coordinates. Um, let me <laughs> just need to get rid of this viewer node. Here we go. So we've been using the object coordinates, doing the dot product of it against 0, 0, 1, and then we're doing the less than. We just need to modify this slightly. So what we're interested in is really this flow value. So we want to compare the coordinate space against the flow value. Let's go ahead and take an input attribute in here. Let's look for flow. Let's make sure that we have some value. So I move this, you can see that we do, fantastic. And we will just plug this into the top of our dot product. And then we will have a look. Okay, it's not quite right what we're looking at here. And in fact, the reason is because we need to be interpolating not back to 0, 0, 0, but back to 0, 0, 1. So we always want to be centered back towards the up vector. You can see that there. It's just going to come back towards 0. There we go, that's nice. We can always increase the speed it comes back. That's pretty cool. All right, maybe 0.2 is good. So return to the up vector. The next thing that we need to do is making sure that <laughs> the water goes back towards zero when we rotate an object. However, how do we do this in shaders? Because we have our object coordinates. Let's see what else we have. We have generated coordinates. Uh, nope, that's not going to help us. We have position on the geometry. This actually is going to stay upright, but then we need to work out the offset based on the object position. I'm going to show you a little secret. So let's take our object coordinates. We are going to use a vector rotate. I'm going to rotate them according to some Euler value. That rotation is going to happen around the center 0, 0, 0, which is just the middle of our object. Let me show you something. Take an input, take an attribute. We're looking for how to find this rotation. Now I see other people doing this with drivers and you right click copy driver. That's a waste of time. If you hover over this and you have Python tooltips enabled, you will see that this says BPY data objects, Suzanne, dot rotation underscore Euler. So this would suggest that there is a vector on the object domain called rotation underscore Euler. And sure enough, there is. So as I start rotating this, you can see that we're actually reading this rotation directly. So when you hover over it, it says dot rotation underscore Euler. So you can use attributes to find a lot of data of your object. Object is for the object stuff. Geometry is for the geometry stuff in here. So there you go. Set this to object, rotation Euler, vector into your rotation on the Euler. And now if we look at this, as I rotate it, no more rotation, but we still have the movement. We still have the location. It's going to work nice. So let's plug this into our dot product instead. Let's view our less than. So now that level stays flat. If I play the animation, then we're going to get some funky rotations in here. All right. We are halfway towards our grand plan. So what happens when it comes to a rest? At the moment, it's like I've got this full of honey. 
I want it to wobble after I've stopped it essentially. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to rotate the surface with an animated sine wave, like a nice smooth wave through time. We're going to use this to rotate our flow vector. And this is going to have the effect of basically changing the direction that our up is looking in. <laughs> let's work out how to do this. Okay, let's, the shader part of this is fairly straightforward. And then we have some simulation. Let's take a input value. Let's look for hash frame. So this is our frame attribute. And you can see, um, actually you're not going to be able to, but trust me when I say that this follows the frame count. So as I go right, that counts up. Let's plug this through a multiply so that we can set the speed, followed by a sine so that we can set the, uh, the sine wave. Let's view this. So pretty fast flashing at the moment. Let's reduce this a little bit, uh, maybe 0.3. So how fast does water actually go? It's pretty quick. Buh, 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 buh. So maybe 0.35 somewhere in that region. Obviously it depends on your frame rate as well. So do be aware of that. So that's our sine wave. Let's plug this through a map range like this. Now we can change this from minus one to positive one, which is the output of a sine. Uh, that wave looks like this and it goes between positive one and negative one. So that's the range. We need to remap this to some rotation vector. Let's try minus 0.5 to 0.5. Now we can take our flow and we can vector rotate it. Join this up. And we will be using this as the angle. The axis needs defining, but for now we can just leave it as it is. So let's have a look at this. This isn't doing anything because we're rotating around zero at zero one. So it's a, a vertical spin. Let's actually rotate this around the Y axis so that we can see. So maybe that is a little bit too steep. Let's reduce this uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Something like that is going to be fine. So you can see these are just kind of sloshing quite happily. Now I need this to actually be in the direction that we've moved. So let's say that we have moved in the X axis. We need the rotation to be about the y-axis to have that kind of side-to-side -side sloshing. Equally, if we've moved in the y-axis, we need it to be around the x-axis. If we think about this, and we have another vector up, that's a known vector. Um, if we were to form a triangle between these two vectors, the normal direction of this triangle, so perpendicular to the surface, is going to be the result of the cross product between the flow map and up. So we can cross these two and that's going to result in the axis of rotation. So let's take our vector. We are going to be using a converter vector math set to cross product. And then in here, we can cross this against the up vector. Um, this actually needs to be underneath here. So the vector into here against up into the axis. And now you can see that when I move, we get that flow and it flows back down towards zero, but then it stops abruptly. So as soon as the, because this is going to be normalized as it becomes the axis, it's an axis in a fixed direction. As soon as we actually touch our flow back onto the upward vector, then the axis is going to be the Z axis. And there you go. Then you're in that same problem. But you can see as I move this, it is kind of working. We just need to work out some more damping for how this should actually, um, how the fall off should happen. I'm going to create a new attribute in my simulation. And this one is going to be called, let's make a bit of space before the flow. This new attribute is going to be called delay. It's going to be a float. And we're going to use this to scale our fluctuations in the water level. And the way that we're going to do this is very similar 
to what we just did down below. But this time, rather than using the vector, we're going to use the speed. So if I have been moving very quickly, this length is going to be high. So the length of this is going to be high. So let's take our length. We are going to be adding this to the named attribute delay. And then we can either mix this or we can subtract from it. It doesn't really matter in this case. We'll use another mix just because it's convenient. We have that factor there. We're going to be mixing towards zero. And once again, we are going to drop this into our simulation output. Let's rename that socket to be delay. Let's go back to the beginning. We are going to use another sample index node. This time it's going to be set to a float, taking the delay value up into this store node attribute. Okay. So now we've sorted out how we're going to be moving stuff and we've created a new attribute that is going to define that fall off for us. Let's take a new attribute in our shader. So we're back to shaders again. Let's take our delay attribute and let's just have a look at what it looks like. So as I play, you can see that we have this. Why aren't we just using the flow attribute directly to work out the length? We already have that attribute. Well, the reason is because we're ending up with a length of one. We're always lerping back to zero, zero, one. So I need to do it based on our movement instead. And then we can just tune how fast we want this fall off to look good. So I'm going to frame up these top nodes here that we just made. This one is going to be called wobble delay. This is essentially how long we're going to be wobbling the fluid for. And if we bring these ones back as well, this one at the bottom, this is going to be our flow. So just name that. Come back to your shader. This is going to be quite simple. Now we're going to take our delay. We're going to use another math node, which we will set to multiply after our angle map range. So we have our frame multiply sign map range. Now we have another multiply, which we will use this factor in. The problem with this, as you're about to find out, is that this delay value can become higher than a value of one. So let's just, uh, so if we just reduce our mix factor up here, then as we are moving this around, there we go. You can see this is going to fall down nicely towards zero, come to a stop. Now, as I move it really quickly, you can see that we can go pretty crazy. This value, this delay value can actually go greater than one. So I am just going to set on here. Use another multiply, uh, which I will change to be minimum. So if I have a minimum against one, then it will always use the smallest value between the attribute and this minimum value. So that means that we can make sure that we never go higher than one. So this just is going to keep our rotation in check and we still get that nice little wobble. Fantastic. Okay. So let's make sure that we're framing stuff as we go here. This is going to be our wobble control J wobble. This is our liquid normal. So the, the normal surface, the normal of the surface of the liquid. That's what we calculated there. We're doing the dot product, uh, but one more thing that you might want actually. So if you're moving this really quickly, you might want to actually, rather than having a flat surface, you might want this to be deformed by noise. We can do this very simply. Let's use a mix color. So mix color. Vector rotate is gonna be our A vector. We will set this to be a linear light. I'm going to take my vector rotate again into some noise as my vector. And I'll use the color in here like this. And then boom, that goes in there. So now you can see that we're wobbling that surface based on the noise texture. Let's reduce the detail. Let's reduce the scale somewhere like this maybe. And now we just need to control this factor based on how aggressively we're shaking it. Fortunately, we have a delay value here, which is going to be higher the more aggressively you're moving that object. 
Let's use this with a map range. We're going to drop this into the factor. We might set this from 0.8 to 1.1 maybe. We can tune this and that's going to be a 0 to, well let's go 0 to 1 for now. So you can see as I move that, we get that distortion. Maybe a little bit less is good. Maybe if I move this up a little bit. So now as I, as I really go for it, this is going to, there we go, just relax nicely there. So there we go. You can always tune this as much as you want. This is a fun system. Okay, so let's actually just frame this up. This is going to be our coordinates. This is our mask that we're using for our liquid. Let's just view our liquid out here. There we go. And now we can go back to our layout. Select our cube. We expose the color so we can now set the color to be whatever we want. And you can see, there we go. As I shake this around, you can get all sorts of effects. One thing that might work a little bit better in this case than the mix on your delay attribute, if I remove that, if we actually use a subtract and we clamp this, so it's always going to be between zero and one, the highest it can ever be is one. We're going to subtract a tiny value, 0.01. Now this is going to drop back towards zero over 10 frames at most, but as you're shaking it, it can stay up at one, but then it's going to immediately start dropping again, which means that that surface ripple from the noise that we just added, that is going to be a little bit less prominent all the time. So there we have it. You can put this on any object now. Maybe let's take a, a an icosphere. link the modifiers and I will set this one to be a different color as well orange here and there we go if you want to change the liquid level you just take your object and you move it but do be aware that this is not preserving the volume so if you rotate it you can see I'm now only half full and now I'm more than half full so it can be a little bit of a trap to try and change that with this, uh, with such a, a non physically accurate simulation, not even a simulation. We're just calculating the difference in position and rotation, and we're using it to get some cool effects. I hope you've enjoyed this session. This was just a little one, a little fun exercise, touching on the new nodes, on the new simulations, and creating a fun little effect. I hope you've had fun. I hope you've learned something. And if you are interested in simulation, then go and check out those new courses that I've released over on Node Group and we can get into some more cool effects. I'll see you in the next video.